everyone. Welcome to today's episode in the GLOBE webinar series on the future of global governance. I am Carrie Otterburn of the Leuven Center for Global Governance Studies, and I will be moderating today's discussion. Today we are joined by Professor Kenneth Abbott and Professor Duncan Snydel to discuss their new book, The Spectrum of International Institutions, an Interdisciplinary Collaboration on Global Governance, published in 2021 by Rutledge. Kenneth Abbott is the Jack E. Brown Professor of Law Emeritus at Sandra Day O'Connor College of Law at Arizona State University. His teaching and research focus on the interdisciplinary study of international law and international relations, including public and private institutions, environmental issues, development pol policy, global health, and international trade and economic law. Duncan Snyder is Professor of International Relations at the University of Oxford and Fellow of Nuffield College and the British Academy. He researches problems of international cooperation and institutions, including international law and international organizations, with an emphasis on institutional design. His current projects focus on multi-partner governance of transnational production and the emergence of informal international organizations such as the G20 as distinct forms of international governance. Also joining us today as discussant is Charles Roger. Charles Roger is Assistant Professor and Beatriz de Pinos Research Fellow at the Institute Barcelona de Estudis Internacionales. His research explores the transformations occurring in our system of global governance and how these are shaping our ability to address cross-border problems. Substantively, his research focuses on informal and transnational institutions in the fields of climate change, international trade, finance, and antitrust. We will begin today's webinar with a presentation by Duncan and Kenneth of about 25 minutes. Uh, then Charles will start off the discussion by offering some reflections and asking a few questions, and Kenneth and Duncan will have an opportunity to respond. Then we will turn to questions from you, the audience. Feel free to send questions to me throughout the webinar by using the Q&A function at the bottom of the Zoom window. I will collect your questions to share with the speakers following the presentations. Before we begin, just a few quick words about the GLOBE project. Funded by the European Commission's Horizon 2020 program, GLOBE seeks to understand the constraints and opportunities for the European Union in promoting its interests and values through global governance, with specific attention to four key areas, trade and development, security and migration, climate change, and global finance. The three and a half year project aims to identify the major roadblocks to effective and coherent global governance by multiple stakeholders in a multipolar world, as well as to look ahead to 2030 and 2050 in order to equip policymakers with the tools they will need to deal with future challenges. On behalf of the GLOBE project, I would like to thank Kenneth, Duncan, and Charles for joining us today. And now it's my great pleasure to turn the floor over to Duncan and Kenneth. You have the floor. Well, thank you for the kind introduction and thanks to Charlie in advance for uh, taking the time to read things and make comments on them. So this book is a book of some of our collected papers that reflect a, a portion of our work in the past. It's not all everything we've done. And we went through and selected a, a, a number of papers that sort of captured a few key themes that we think are really important for us and for global governance, having to do with the diversity of governance, governance actors, the diverse, diversity of govern, governance institutions, and perhaps especially a focus on the role of soft and indirect forms of governance in um, changing how we, how we govern the world. Uh, with all, within all this, there's a, a common method of sorts of how we've approached things. Uh, we don't wear it on our sleeves. Um, but it does characterize our work. And I, I thought it's part of one thing I'll do in my part of the presentation. I'll sort of highlight some of the elements that go on within that. So when Ken and I set up down to canvas our papers, uh, including some that are still ongoing, I think we will always have ongoing papers. Um, we, we thought they fit into two sort of uh, related but somewhat different groups. The first half, which are not in this volume, but might be in a, in a second volume, uh, if Rutledge um, decides they want to go forward with it. Um, but the half is, is not in the volume, reflects an, an older tradition just for us and, and for the field actually, of looking at more formal institutions from a more purely status perspective uh, and really building on the uh, cooperation on, on our anarchy theme that started a lot of the international institutional literature with, in international relations when we first got going. I wanna mention though they're not directly part of the volume, but they actually set up things in, in really an important way. So the first paper Ken and I did together was call, called something like why are there formal international organizations which actually sort of a funny question if you think about it right now because first of all there are loads of international organizations out there and secondly there's an enormous amount of work looking at international organizations in the field but that really wasn't the case when we wrote that article it was a reasonable question to ask 
not in the sense that there weren't people doing descriptive things about international organizations, but the centerpiece of the field, the, the sort of theoretical work, had actually completely set aside all institutions. And the theme was cooperation under anarchy. Anarchy was taken as if it didn't have any institutions. Interesting question there. Um, but regardless, you didn't need international institutions yet. Ken and I were looking around uh, as, as we do, and we thought, gee, these institutions are there for a reason. They're doing something. Um, wh what do they do and, and um, what role do they play? And then we talked about their roles as providing just the benefits of centralization in and of itself, providing independence um, in the sense we often see with, with um, organizations like courts, and also serving functions, which we call community representative, uh, of, of sort of playing some, some more collective roles that can't be done by the individual um, actors. The second paper we turned to was on soft law and the concept of legalization. Now again, there were loads of people looking at, at international law, a lot of lawyers looking at, at it doctrinally. And as an international relations um, person, I thought, boy, they're just taking this stuff way too seriously. Uh, it just doesn't matter. In the way it matters. But Ken, from his perspective, thought, well, international law is doing something and, and, um, and sort of pushed me hard. And, and I pushed him back on why do we have these things? How exactly does it work? Um, and at that point in time, international relations scholars had basically abandoned the study of international law at all. We were fortunate, I think, to be among the first people to sort of come back to the question. Uh, we had the advantages of one being a lawyer, one being an international relations specialist, but also both being able to talk to each other on these things. Uh, and we sort of pursued all this and, and already in, in our development of, of soft law, uh, and the, the term was out there, we, we, we actually took it from someone who opposed it as, as, a, as a violation of the ideal of law, uh, but there was work developing on soft law and, and we took a pretty positive view of it, trying to understand why this different institutional form arose, um, how it differed from hard law, and actually using both hard law and soft law to create, in effect, ideal types of law and the notion of a continuum, varieties, or spectrum, hence the title of the volume, uh, between all these things. That leads to a whole bunch of other questions about when you would have one type of law versus other type of law, remembering there are many types, and are there transitions among them? Is there developmental logic here or not? And one of the things that, that um, I think does characterize our work is that when we see different institutions, we don't take them as failures because we couldn't get a, the right institution. Often they're there for good reasons. So soft law to, to a doctrinal lawyer is, is a disaster. It's a bad thing. We should get rid of it. Uh, thus, it's possibly a better solution to the problem. And the reason states have soft law is they actually prefer to solve their problems without having to give, give up sovereignty and have other types of intrusions. Now, from those two papers, I just want to draw out a couple of, of um, thoughts on, on how does we've sort of organized and structured our work, which I think informs everything in, this, in the volume. First of all, it's interdisciplinary. Uh, we do come from different perspectives. We we blended and merged a bit ourselves, I think, over time and, and grown closer in, in these things, but we still do have some differences. Um, but they're around common questions. And in the differences, we come to um, looking at both the positive side of things, but also the normative side, which is always figured in these things. We're also, on one hand, quite cynical, uh, but also sort of optimistic about how these things work. And it's a tension between those things that matters a lot. So, secondly, uh, our, um, our work is, is theoretically is theoretical, especially in the sense of con conceptual theorizing. Um, we're not issue focused. Um, we're not driven by the particular problems or particular issues. Uh, indeed, we know a lot about many things. I don't know that we know many things in, in the sort of depth that scholars who really work on things know. Um, but it allows us to be driven by the broad based questions of cooperation and institutionalization that surround these things. And you see that in, in the sorts of concepts that we, we've worked on. We've worked on standards. What do we mean by a standard? Well, that's a standard is not just a technical standard. It's not, not just a legal standard. It's a much wider range of things within which both those categories themselves fall. Or concepts like orchestration, which um, is really trying to think through how can we characterize this type of governance and, and what can we do with it? Soft law mentioned, uh, regulatory standard setting, I'll, I'll get to in a second. Um, in all these cases though, what we get is a baseline of a stylized ideal type, something to organize our work around. Uh, but we take them as just that idealized types, not things that actually exist in the world, but as if you like, as conceptual points in the world around which we can organize and understand how things work and how they sometimes fail in different situations. This leads us to a pretty broad view of governance. Uh, and I should say one of the key characteristics of that is that it's a pretty horizontal view. We, we are reacting against the, 
traditional status view of domestic governance that, that thinks of centralized authority, we think centralized authority really matters. At, at the international level, often it doesn't exist to the same extent. So we tend to see combinations with perhaps a little bit of central authority, but much more horizontal and, and uh, more broad-based authority. Uh, another element of our work is that it's all pretty rational, rational choicey uh, in its origins, but it takes a very broad view of goal seeking. Uh, to my taste, many people who use rational choice have a very narrow view of people. I think people are much richer and broader than that. So our, our actors can be anyone and the goals they pursue can be everything. And in some of the legal work, we, we talk a lot about uh, pursuing both values and interests, trying to use that distinction, uh, but, but also the combination, it's both of them being pursued at various points in time. And to, to our taste, Many of the disputes that people fight over in the field shouldn't be disputes at all. So, for example, the interest versus ideas approach is ludicrous. Uh, you can't imagine actors only having interests or only having ideas. Interests are ideas, ideas are interests, and so on and so forth. And it's understanding how the two come together. Another thing that I've already mentioned is our empirical strategy. It's one to scan cases very broadly. Ken and I have spent enormous time in his office, in uh, hotel bars, in all sorts of of odd locations, just hallucinating, I like to use the term hallucinating, trying to think about a wide range of different examples and ask what do they have in common and what can we pull out of those things to develop and to hone our concepts and work on that. And the final, final methodological pr principle that I think underlies our work uh, is one of having good timing and taking advantage of serendipity. But by good timing, uh, just, on international relations, international law, that was going to happen anyway. We just happened to be in the right spot, thinking about the interconnection of these things as a whole bunch of other people were, do, were doing the same sort of thing. Same true for international organizations. Uh, obviously, we were driven a bit by what was going on in the world, but we had the, the fortune of good timing to be a little ahead of other people and, and getting some of these ideas out of that. And the serendipity is that um, Ken and I have never been that all that directed in our work in the sense of we, we, we obviously have a, com a lot of common themes on our underlying it, but we've never sat down and done, done a five or 10 year plan on, on where to take things. It's been sort of reacting to things and, and we're very susceptible to, if, if you phone us up and say, I've got a good idea for conference, it's a great topic, a great set of people and a great location and good food or something, we're there. And then we'll work out later how exactly we'll do that. And I think being open, because those requests of course come from, from smart people with good ideas, often lead you in pretty good directions here. Um, and actually, a great example of that is the first substantive paper in the volume, which is on, st on standards and standard setting, uh, which then leads us into doing a whole lot of things. Now, because Walter Matley, who's, who's done some great work on financial and, and other regulations, um, basically got hold of us and said, you know, would you like to work on standards? And we didn't quite say, what are those? Uh, but we did sort of say, well, tell us a bit more. And he said, said he wanted to do this. He had, had a good slate of people he wanted to invite. He wanted to do it in Florence. That seemed pretty attractive. Um, and so we decided, well, let's, let's do a paper on, on standards. And so we sat down and we, again, had knew a bit of the rationalist theory on Pagubian standards and what would now be called network standards. We could tie that together with the game theory concepts of PD and coordination. We could look at the world, all sorts of examples of obvious regulatory standards for technical things, but also governance standards, legal standards. And we sort of just worked through that and sort of came up with what we thought was a pretty good framework for how to think about these different things. Uh, again, it was sort of, he gave sort of a charge and we took it and that led on to a whole bunch of other things, including, uh, it might be the next paper in the standard, our, our beginning work on regulatory standard setting. Because once we had started thinking about standards, we got into a whole bunch of questions about who sets these things, who should set them? Why should they have the right to do it? What are the consequences of setting all these things? And so we, started to look more at standards and standard setting. And we sort of took a two-pronged approach. Uh, one was asked, well, who, who out there is setting standards? And as we do, we canvassed all the examples we could think of of standard setting going on in the world. At that point in time, the, the cleanest, clearest examples were on uh, labor regulations and things. There were some on environment regulations. And when we looked at, those, at the cases going on, first of all, states have, have always been setting standards. That's, that's one reason for the state in the first place. So the states have been setting standards for a long time. International organizations like the ILO, I guess you know more recently, have come in to look at the standards business and that. And there are obvious reasons they should be involved in transnational things and coordinating uh, standards across countries, avoiding competition. But then if you look harder, you saw 
non-governmental organizations trying to set standards, whether it's Amnesty International or the Sullivan Principles or the Clean Clothes Campaign, some Dutch activists trying to get into regulating labor and that. And then firms are setting standards, but why are firms trying to regulate themselves? And you look at them, some of it is, is reactive. They're trying to head off uh, regulation by others, but some of it's proactive because they actually care about these things too. Um, and after we, we assembled a long list of these things, we decided we had to systematize it. And that we came up with this notion of governance triangle, which was putting three different actors at the vertex of a symmetric triangle. So states and IOs at one vertex, NGOs and activists at another vertex, and firms and, um, and uh, firm alliances uh, uh, at, at the third vertex. And then points inside the governance sphere could be used to represent to like the share of governance the different actors make. And that nice feature of a simplex is it adds to one. So literally any point on that, that triangle uh, divided the, the whatever you're looking at, in this case, the authority or control of standard setting. And just by, by plotting those, we noticed some things. First of all, over time, we noticed an, an, a, a real change in the frequency. Uh, there's more standard setting going on everywhere. Uh, but in the 80s, it's really just the state, a couple of the Sullivan principles, there are very few things there. By the time you get to the 2000s, every firm has a corporate social responsibility thing. Uh, there are now alliances between NGOs and, and uh, firms, the, the uh, Forest uh, Stewardship Initiative and the Forest Stewardship Council being examples of different types of combinations of things like that. So we see this big increase over time. And the other thing, this is more impressionist than statistical, um, there's a movement of, uh, standard setting schemes from the vertices towards the center. That is to say, there's more interaction among different actors. And that of course then leads to the question, why are we getting these different schemes? And why are we getting this change in schemes involving combinations of actors? And we start theorizing what's going on. Why do different actors do it? They have political goals. They all want to do this because they want to control something in the world. Uh, and that, that makes sense. But why do they have to do it together? Well, because they have different competencies. Uh, states can do it themselves domestically in the sense that they have have certain capacities that empower them, like legal authority, for example. But you need IGOs if you want to do things transnationally and coordinate and manage those things. But actually, you need firms too, because firms actually, if there's bad stuff going on in the in the in, in the world, firms usually are involved somehow. They have the local knowledge about what they're doing and what they could do, which is equally important there. And NGOs play a whole bunch of roles, ranging from sometimes being um, uh, fire alarm trippers, other times be coming up with new ideas for governance and such. And they sort of fit in the mix too. So we look at these different capacities and ask how they come together. And it leads us to, to a pretty broad conception of governance that it does and should involve a whole bunch of different actors in different combinations and different settings. Those, those things have to be figured out. Um, and that leads to um, different combinations of governance and governance working quite differently uh, such. And in all this, even when we look at places where this, the state is centrally involved in domestic things, we go back to the domestic here, um, there's literature at that time was coming out along on new governance. And that was this, this hard domestic state that could govern things itself, found out it actually could do it either more effectually or at least do it because it couldn't do it otherwise by actually engaging firms directly, getting them involved in it. So we see the same types of governance we're looking at the, at the, at the international level, reoccurring at the domestic level, but uh, of all, we're seeing a whole bunch of diversity here. And that, can I'm gonna hand off to you in a second, that leads to a, a, a notion that um, this decentralized system might or might not be a good system on its own. And there might be some need for some centralized coordination, some sort of orchestration. Again, this is not hierarchical central governance, but it is a notion that it needs governance. And sometimes governance requires a governor or some small set of actors to, to lead things. And Ken is going to explain how all that works. Thank you, thank you. Welcome to everybody. We're glad to have you here on this webinar. <clears throat> so Duncan sort of left off with this governance triangle and institutional diversity. We wish we could show this triangle to you, but it's stuck in an airport somewhere uh, right now. Uh, but if you look at it, the especially the later iterations, you know, the first iterations don't show that many institutions. Looking back, it's kind of surprising how sparse those first governance triangles were that we were able to draw these conclusions out of. If you do it now, there are hundreds of schemes in all of these different zones. So you look at this triangle and you see tremendous institutional density and you see tremendous institutional diversity. And we concluded from this that <clears throat> in that kind of condition, 
individual institutions are are rarely, if ever, standalone, truly standalone actors who can be analyzed individually. You also have to focus on their relationships and their interactions. Uh, one set of interactions is built into the governance triangle, that's collaboration and partnership. Uh, other literatures look at other kinds of interactions. So there's a whole, li whole literature called institutional interactions. There's one on regime complexes. Duncan and Walter Matley and George Peel have one on choosing among, uh, governors choosing among different uh, institutions. So we decided in this richness of theory to focus on what we call indirect governance in which one institution intentionally works through one or more other institutions in order to achieve its goals. <clears throat> and as soon as we looked at this, we quickly found that it was pervasive even in areas where it was largely unrecognized. So for example, we worked with uh, David Levy Farr from Hebrew University of Jerusalem on regulation, which is normally framed as a two-party operation where a regulator regulates some set of targets. But we found that all kinds of regulation, domestic regulation, <clears throat> transnational regulation, like that on the governance triangle, international regulation, in all these cases, there are all kinds of intermediaries involved. So we realized we were on the right track with this indirect governance. We developed a two by two that tries to show the types of indirect, indirect governance that exist. Uh, and the two by two includes hard and soft relationships between the governor and the intermediary and direct uh, governance of the targets versus indirect governance of the targets using intermediaries. And this turns out to encompass a number of literatures and uh, lots of forms of governance. So hierarchy with traditional two-party regulation, delegation, which encompasses PA theory, collaboration between governors and targets, which is another aspect of the new governance movement Duncan mentioned, <clears throat> and orchestration, which then was the least known of these modes. So uh, orchestration is the indirect soft form of govern governance. The orchestrator, the governor, works through intermediaries, but it doesn't control the intermediaries hierarchically the way that principals can control agents through contracts and sanctions and so on. <clears throat> I think Duncan mentioned this already, but we identified orchestration as a central element of domestic new governance. When the state brings in non-state actors to perform governance functions on its behalf, it typically doesn't just let them do whatever they want, but it steers them through soft mechanisms to carry out the state's goals. Our 2009 paper on the governance triangle, which first introduced the idea of orchestration, argues that more orchestration would be desirable, both to strengthen non-state and public-private institutions and to regulate them, to limit free riding, uh, say, by the business participants. This approach brought us together with Philip Genschel and Bernhard Zangl, who were then both in Bremen, and we're working on a project called the transformation of the state. And in that project, they were they were looking at domestic states and they were seeing the same things we were seeing in terms of new governance uh, at the transnational level. <clears throat> so we began, we went over there, you know, they invited us to come to Bremen. So if we get a nice invitation, we go. And the four of us went and, and spent a week talking and uh, many years and many uh, meetings and drafts later, we published an edited volume on orchestration in 2015. Here in this volume, we include the theoretical chapter on orchestration and also the conclusion from that book, which we think is one of the best things we've ever done, uh, but it's also one of the least cited things we've ever done. So I encourage people to look at the conclusion. That volume uh, focuses on orchestration by international organizations, although many actors orchestrate, and it finds it pervasive. Perhaps the most uh, interesting finding of that book we hypothesized that the member states of international organizations would resist orchestration by the IGO because the IGO might try to regulate them. Uh, but it turns out <clears throat> that states often prefer uh, international organizations to orchestrate and even structure them so that they can do it and mandate them to do it. And we speculate this is because <clears throat> IGO orchestration allows states to obtain some degree of governance without having to delegate extensive powers to the IGOs. So we've continued to work with Genschel and Zangl uh, even beyond what's included in this volume. Here we include 
a 2020 article on the governor's dilemma, so-called, another concept, which is the basis of a more recent edited volume, <clears throat> in which we further elaborate the modes of indirect governance. So here we define four very broad forms, this time based on first, whether the governor initiates the intermediary relationship by granting authority to the intermediary, as in PA relationships or delegation relationships, as we call them, or by enlisting the pre-existing authority of the intermediary, which is what orchestrators do. And second, whether the governor subsequently manages that relationship by hard means <clears throat> or by soft means. And this gives us on the off diagonal, these two very interesting concepts of co-optation and trusteeship. The heart of this paper though, and the heart of the book is what we call the competence control trade-off. So every governor wants their intermediaries to be competent, but the problem is the more competent they are, the more difficult it is to control them. And this is not just because of imperfect information as PA theory tells us, it's because of the power of the intermediaries, the dependence of the governor on its intermediaries. So the governor can conversely decide to impose strict controls on its intermediaries, but if it does that, it erodes their competencies or stunts their development. So the four modes, and we believe that this, this uh, trade-off, <clears throat> as the new governance analogy suggests, is not limited at all to international relations, but is found in all indirect governance settings, domestic, transnational, international. The four modes that we identify manage the competence control trade-off differently. So up to a point, at least, depending on the circumstances, governors can select a mode that matches their preferences. And this helps us to explain a lot of extremely interesting, seemingly nonsensical things. If you look at the book on the governor's dilemma, it's remarkable in the breadth of its empirical cases, uh, domestic, international, security, you know, everything. Uh, for example, seemingly nonsensical things like authoritarian governments uh, constantly appointing incompetent loyalists or party hacks to important positions becomes really clear why they do this and what the costs are. Um, let me I just say a word on where we're going with this now. After all, you've heard us talk about the governor all the time. Uh, and we haven't talked very much about the intermediaries who are essential players in all of these forms of indirect government. So we started out trying to look <clears throat> more closely at the nature of intermediaries. And right now we're working on a project about loyalty, which takes us in an entirely new direction. With loyal, if intermediaries have different kinds of loyalty, for example, personal loyalty to the governor, they'll act in one way. If they have a different kind of loyalty to their institution, for example, uh, they'll act in a different way. In the Trump years, we saw many examples of all of these things. If Trump was demanding personal loyalty and dealing with people in government who had different kinds of loyalty and found themselves in extremely uncomfortable positions. So. We published a paper on this, it's too late to include in the volume, uh, but we're continuing to work on that and take a look at that, it's quite interesting. So let me just wrap up with some reflections. <clears throat> you know, we've been collaborating for more than 25 years before the end of the Cold War. <laughs> uh, this may only be of interest to us, but sometimes people do ask, how have you been able to do this for so long? And in the introduction to this volume, we include a couple of thoughts on this. Most importantly, I suppose, this, this is a scholarly collaboration, so you need common intellectual interests and values. As Duncan mentioned, we have different disciplinary backgrounds, but they've proven to be highly complementary, and they've kind of morphed into a joint uh, approach over the years. Beyond that, though, I think it's important to say that <clears throat> I got my start in IR by importing the foreign ideas of IR into international law. And while we're generally seen as rationalists, and that, that I think that's completely fair, we're both open to trespassing and borrowing and bringing disparate ideas into our work. And I believe that's enriched it greatly. Because we've rarely been physically together, collaboration means meeting for collaborative sessions. And we've held these collaborative sessions all over the world, you know, on planes, on trains, in restaurants, and bars. The bars ones tend to be pretty short. Uh, hotel lobbies, different kind of offices, on the margins of conferences, et cetera. Uh, 
if you don't find this sort of thing stimulating, collaboration is not going to work. And we found them extremely enjoyable. Uh, many of the meetings are structured. We work around outlines. We work around drafts. But the best ones, as Duncan already said, are unstructured, where we can play around with ideas, sketch out diagrams like the governance triangle on napkins, uh, throw out examples, think about what would be a catchy term like orchestration or governance triangle. I got to say, this stuff is fun. Uh, and I think it's essential to have fun in what you do if you're going to continue doing it for a long time. Then the actual writing uh, is pretty arduous, <clears throat> but it really wrings the most out of a collaboration. Everything we've written, every word has been completely co-authored. We've worked through, both of us, every word of what we've written instead of dividing it out. And working through that level of detail on concepts and examples is certainly arduous, but it ensures that each of us contributes everything that we can. Finally, let me just say that, you know, scholars, we don't often discuss personal matters in public, uh, but I think personal matters are at least as important as intellectual ones in terms of a longstanding collaboration. Uh, to take one example, it's impossible to work together this long unless you both have lively senses of humor and senses of humor that are largely consistent. Uh, also, we discovered early on that we both come from relatively unsophisticated backgrounds. Neither one of us is a glitzy Manhattanite. And we found early on that we could bond over simple pleasures. One of the first was root beer, which people outside the United States may not even know what that is. It was the kind of soda. Later on, we found that we very much enjoyed martinis. Uh, so that in conclusion, let me just say that as our understandings of law and governance get softer, our drinks get harder. Uh, everything, like Duncan started out saying, is a continuum, including beverages. So I'll wrap that up here. <clears throat> Thank you so much, uh, Kenneth and Duncan. This was a really enjoyable overview of your work together and also going into some of the concepts. But we'll now turn to Charlie to um, offer some reflections and maybe some questions. But I'd also like to remind the audience that you can uh, feel free to send questions to the Q&A box at the bottom of the Zoom window. We'll get to those after we hear from Charlie. Wonderful. Thank you, Kari. It's great to be here. Um, and first, I'd like to say what an honor it is to be able to discuss Ken and Duncan's work. Uh, it's been really fundamental for my own thinking about global governance. And I can recall reading many of their articles as a, as a master's student, as a PhD student, um, and finding in that, that body of work a wealth of concepts, theories, and ideas. And to be honest, a way of thinking systematically about governance problems. Um, I've used many of their pieces, as I'm sure is true of others, uh, in my classes, and perhaps it's also worth mentioning that my very first article, or I guess major article, was, uh, was an effort to engage with the idea of orchestra orchestration, which I found enormously valuable for understanding everything that I was seeing in my particular issue area of climate change, and I, I'm sure that, uh, you know, that experience is replicated many times over. So looking back on this work and reading this book has been a great experience um, because while I already know many of these pieces, um, the intellectual coherence of the project uh, over uh, roughly, I guess, two decades or, or a little bit more um, from the first article to the last um, really comes out. Right. Um, and it's also just easy to see. And this is something that I didn't fully uh, appreciate um, until, uh, I guess, you know, looking at everything side by side is the way that the work uh, builds on past insights. So you can see the kernels of thought uh, in one uh, and the puzzles raised in, in one piece, laying the basis for later studies that un then unpack uh, these different elements. Um, and it's interesting to me as well uh, how their work has flowed from a discrete an or analysis of sort of discrete phenomena, which are clearly within the field of IR, formal IOs, international law, IO orchestration, and so on and so forth, to these more general dilemmas of governance uh, that appear across a variety of contexts um, and allowing for, I think that 
at some point in the volume you use the term unconventional comparisons, which I think is really fantastic and always a mark of good research when you're juxtaposing these, these different ideas. So um, that said, while I was reading, I did, and I suppose it's my job to come up with a number of uh, questions along the way. So, um, and some of which I have to say, I've always wanted to ask. Uh, so some uh, relate to theories and claims and some are more general. So um, on, on, so my first question is on, on the foundations of your work. And um, again, when you read this book, there's this remarkably consistent approach to anal analysis, um, and that's grounded, uh, although not limited to a rational choice framework. And as I said, many of the insights build on earlier ones, And but across that, there's remarkable consistency, as I've said. But still, I'd be surprised if there was no change in your thinking or approach. And so I was wondering, how do you read some of your earlier material today? Um, which points, for instance, would you uh, see or express differently in view of the later insights? And what part of your work, perhaps also including how you both work together, has changed the most? The second question is about regulatory standard setting. Okay, so the first section of your book. And so uh, the, the ideas that you develop around this are really useful, conceptualizing governance arrangements in terms of the triangle, thinking dynamically about uh, RSS in terms of the anime governance process, um, and linking this all to the, the sort of core insight that you need different actors coming together in order for governance um, to, uh, for all those complementary capabilities to come together and governance to be effective. Now, I agree with this approach in its broad outlines, but one of the challenges uh, that I have um, with, with this is that it's somewhat divorced from the national political context, let's say, that a lot of these actors, states, of course, uh, but non-state actors, uh, NGOs and businesses actually have to operate in, whether they be democratic, autocratic, developing, developed, and so on and so forth. And so others have, including myself, I, I would say, have pointed to the importance of understanding systematically how that context um, shapes uh, regulatory standard setting. And however, I'm curious to know a little bit more about how you would bring it into your framework. And to what degree are certain expectations that come out of your uh, your understanding of regulatory standard setting changed when we do that? The third question is on the practice of orchestration. So your original work, uh, which as I've said, was quite inspirational for my own, um, elaborated the idea and then posited the what or posited that there was an orchestration deficit that there wasn't enough organized orchestration and that there should be more in order to maximize the potential of regulatory standard setting and so i wonder now after you've done more work on this do you think that that's true now later work seems to have uh you know especially the orchestration volume seems to have suggested that orchestration is actually quite pervasive that it, you know you find it going back to the 1950s in the case of the world health organization and so on and so forth um but whether you think that that's true or not it seems to me that the strategy has been embraced quite significantly since you started writing on uh the topic and to me uh the paris agreement is a really great example of that so i wonder how you view this claim now and also the, the claim that there was an orchestration deficit or that there is one and then also how you evaluate these subsequent developments the fourth question is on governance. So turning to the third section of your book. And so, I, as I mentioned, I think that it's really fascinating how um, uh, the work on orchestration has paved the way for a sort of more general understanding of governance. But there's, and so there's a real evolution that I see ac across the different sections of the book. But one thing, one there's one way in which there is a continuity and that's your theoretical focus begins from the perspective of the governor. And I think that in a sense, this, this sort of crystallized for me what makes the Abbott and Snyder approach to comparative institutional analysis somewhat special and unique. Um, I think if I was to compare it, I think of someone like Hans Morgenthau saying that realist scholars should be theorizing from the perspective of statesmen and women, um, but you ask us to do so from the perspective of global governors. And this newest work captures the dilemmas that they face really well, 
Um, but it strikes me that the governors themselves are a bit of a black box that probably requires some further unpacking. Is this one governor or is it many actors? Are their preferences aligned or not? And my question actually then leads, uh, of course, to this research that you're doing right now, which is, do they inspire loyalty in their intermediaries? Because that seems to be uh, a really important thing. Now, in some cases, as in the book on orchestration, I think some of this comes out. But how do we think differently? about governance dilemmas if we start to think about variation in the governors themselves. Now, my final question is uh, is looking forward. So, and it's probably for the next generation of researchers. Um, and I wanted you to maybe just lay out a little bit for you, what you think are the most exciting directions that you hope to see the field moving in and uh, particularly younger researchers um, moving in as they're setting out on some of their first projects. Okay, that's it for me. Thank you so much again for the opportunity to read the book and for all of your work over the years. Um, I'm really looking forward to what comes next. Thank you, Charlie. Uh, we That's a lot of questions. Uh, so we'll get right over to you, Kenneth, and back in uh, we can, before we get to the Q&A with the audience. <clears throat> uh, how do we do this? Let's see. You want to go first? You want me to? Uh, either way, either okay. way. I'll, I'll say a couple of things, then you can fill in. First, Charlie, thank you. Those, those are they're very, very uh, gracious questions, uh, and uh, and they're, they're good questions too. I I can't answer all of them, but I'll, I'll cover a few of them, and Ken will pick up with pieces. First, you know, how's thinking changed? Um, it's, I mean, introspection is not my strongest point, probably. Uh, I don't think my basic view on how to think about problems or goal-seeking actors, I, that's just how I think, but I understand systems matter and other things matter. And I'm actually trying to do some more stuff on my own independent can on, on systems type thing. But, but in the end, I, I just think an actor-oriented approach makes a lot of, a lot of sense as a way to get, get things. Uh, I really do have a strong penchant for simplifying and it, it allows you to get in and, and, and uh, identify things. I think the biggest change in, in there uh, has actually been becoming less statist over time. Uh, and that was, I think, just because of the nature of the problems we were looking at and also the world's changed. Global governance has become less state-oriented than it was. Though at heart, I'm still a statist. And I think states are the most important actors. Uh, and I actually even, for all their sins, think they're, they're normative reasons why, why they're really important actors too, at least until we can find something to, to replace them on that. Um, on the orchestration deficit, um, I, I guess I, I think things are so messed up at the global level that I'm sure we need more governance of some type out there that I, I don't believe that the decentralized or spontaneous things will work. Orchestration has this nice feature and I'm, I'm no libertarian, but it's got this nice feature. It doesn't create a lot of bureaucracy. It doesn't create the institutions which themselves can sometimes become the problem. It's because it's softer and less intrusive. It, it, it gives us a way to approach things, but uh, you're right. There's more orchestration, but there's still much less. You, use the World Health example, that's obviously one for the past episode. It's not, it doesn't have its governance right. It actually could do some more orchestration to manage things better, I suspect. I, I think, um, though a, a good question might be, now that we have a lot of orchestration out there, is there some bad orchestration going on that we should learn about? It could be bad because it's being used for bad purposes, or it could be bad because it's not being done well. But I think either way, it'd be nice to sort of be more um, scrutinous of, of orchestration itself. And then secondly, and this relates to one of your other questions, there is an interesting question about who should be the orchestrator. Uh, and so in the, in the edited volume, we have the international organization as the orchestrator. Um, but it could be, uh, first of all, which, or, which international organization or should it be someone else completely within which international organization? A, a nice way to think about it, think about some of your own work too, is should it be the G7, the G20 or the UN? And if we think of that continuum, they bring with them different advantages and disadvantages being orchestrator, realizing that, that whoever's the orchestrator has enormous political consequences for distributive and power and other sorts of considerations on, on that too. Um, and on, one of the other things you, you raised was that we're very governor focused, which I think that that's right. I'm sure that's right. I, I take your, your useful amendments as being good ones that would be nice to look at problems of, of multiple governors and things like that. Uh, and as Ken said, we've actually now tried to turn things around. So we're looking more at the things from the intermediary's perspective. He may disagree with this, but one thing I always find interesting when we are ever do this, we end up coming back to the governor. 
because actually in governors matter more. Uh, and often uh, intermediaries are, are plentiful and you can, they can switch around. So a lot of our work, even when we're, when we're trying as hard as we can at folks in the intermediary, we find ourselves flipping back and looking at the governor uh, on that. So that's an interesting question too. Then uh, two, two final things. One about our, our, our collaboration, just building up Ken's book. Uh, Ken, I've always had sort of a tortoise hair problem. And I don't mean to draw the analogy all the way, but I'm clearly the tortoise and this, this, and he's the hare. And normally the tortoise looks like a good guy and that's not my claim. Um, but it really is, um, I, I, I tend to work pretty slowly and Ken, Ken, I think works faster than me. And he's always sort of ahead of me saying, catch up, catch up, catch up as I'm waddling through or whatever tortoises do to get there. I think that's actually been a real virtue in, in our work in that um, we haven't published quickly. We've been actually very slow. We're right now working on a revision of the paper that was first presented 20 years ago. Um, but I think it's a lot better for it. I think Ken, Ken's pretty frustrated with the whole, the whole experience, quite frankly. Um, but, and this goes to your question about advice to other sc scholars and such. I, I think going slow makes sense that, that it, it sometimes, seems attractive to be the first one to get an idea out. But if an idea is worthwhile, there are gonna be multiple people commenting on it and better to get a good shot out than the first shot out in many of these cases. And um, that I'd encourage people looking for future research projects to look at, look at current problems, but don't look at them as a flash in the pan thing. Don't, don't write to the newspapers, write to much longer term type things. And the first thing to ask yourself about any problem, is it really new or can I think about it going backwards? So if you look at the current agenda, things like cyber and artificial intelligence would be, seem to be, you know, right at the top of the list, things we really have to care about with enormous implications. Um, but we've had technological change before. And so I'd encourage people to think about technolo technological change in the past, to learn the lessons of governance for that. They won't all plan in the future, but they'll give us some good hints. And if we look at cyber, for example, we've seen the same thing in the development of nuclear weapons for a lot of the problems, not for all of them, that we can think about for governing on that. Ken, I'll pass over to you then. You're willing. <clears throat> okay. Um, yeah, thank you, Charlie. These really are very great questions. That they're a little difficult to answer in some cases, which shows how good they are. So on how our work was changed, I agree that I think the biggest thing is that this change from status to non-status, which really is the way we pre presented this, the way we organized this presentation is sort of moving along that continuum. <clears throat> I actually think that the earlier stuff was a little richer in terms of bringing in constructivist ideas, like, you know, this community representative notion about formal organizations in our very first paper. Uh, organizations are not just, um, international organizations are not just utilitarian bodies, but they encapsulate norms, they encapsulate community goals uh, and hold them up for, for observation and for following. And in a way, we've gotten away from some of that. And there was that in international law, too, almost by necessity. And I think perhaps one of the reasons is um, our collaborations, especially once we get into with Philip and Bernhardt, uh, trying to be very rigorous. So you try to be very rigorous, you force yourself into these rational methodologies, and it's hard to bring in broader things. We hope to publish a second volume, which includes the earlier papers, legalization, formal organizations. And what we've uh, said to the publisher is that if we do that, if you publish that, <laughs> we'll write another new introduction in which we try to think the earlier stuff from a later perspective. Uh, but we might actually use it to think some of the late, rethink some of the later stuff from the earlier perspective in the way I just said this. And Duncan is certainly right about how our, uh, work together has changed over time. So talking generally about collaboration, um, there's a lot of transactions cost to this. And you could even say there's entropy to this, especially if you're not together. Um, going slow may be a virtue, but uh, you can overdo it even with virtues. Uh, and it's, you know, it's really, really been hard to keep moving together in these late years. Um, national political context, yeah, I think actually for non-state governance, both the political context in the host state and the political context in the home state are important. So it's the political context in the home state that determines if there's orchestration or support. Um, it's in the, the, the 
the host state is essential because a lot of these mechanisms are designed to bypass the host state, which won't adopt labor rules, won't adopt environmental rules. And authoritarian governments have been pretty good at stamping these things out. It occurs to me that it might be <clears throat> that business-focused organizations would be able to maintain a greater entree than NGO-based organizations, because the NGOs seem to pose more of a social threat to the authoritarians, but I'm not really sure about that. <clears throat> Um, on the orchestration deficit, yeah, I've written about the orchestration in the in the climate regime increasing, and there is a lot of it. But I would say that's a particular case where a lot of orchestration is concentrated. If you look at all the fields, even in, even within the environment, let alone you know labor rights and other issues, uh, you don't see anywhere near the kind of organized orchestration that you do in that one regime. Uh, and secondly, I think it's very weak, the kinds of orchestration that take place there. <clears throat> it's interesting, but it's weak. So we identified two types. One is a directive orchestration where you it's not hierarchical or mandatory, but it takes a, uh, a mandatory benefit and makes it conditional on doing certain things. <clears throat> That's how the orchestration is done. We don't see that at all. The other category, more common, is facilitative organization, where you actually support and encourage and provide resources of co uh, cognitive resources or material resources to your intermediaries. We see some of that. <clears throat> but in the climate regime, what we mainly see is something you might call promotional orchestration. Sort of just try to get as many as you can, highlight the ones that are successful. Uh, now, that's interesting. Uh, we didn't really talk about that. It might be a new kind. I've just seen a paper which I can't remember who wrote it, but it talks about this as sort of a strategy of exemplification, you know, trying to introduce good practices by publicizing uh, successful cases. So that's quite interesting, but it's really pretty weak. Uh, <clears throat> I think governors, Duncan pretty much talked about governors. I agree with you that collective governors in particular are important. And I would say the reason we haven't done more is simply how complicated the analysis gets. We once tried to do this outline where we had all the different variations among governors and then all the different variations among intermediaries and put them all together and it was just so top heavy that you couldn't possibly work with it. Um, yeah, governors inspiring loyalty, we are looking at that and it's quite interesting because some of it is innate to the type of governor. For example, governors who had to take really strong ideological stands can be extremely attractive to a lot of people who, who are looking for a guidepost in their lives and immediately give their loyalty to that figure. But it's also a strategy of governors to do things that inspire loyalty so they can get people to be loyal to them. It's very interesting. Uh, for the next generation, not writing to the newspaper is a good idea. And, and I think, you know, the kind of research we've done is, I call it horizontal, that it's not climate research, you know, or biodiversity research or arms control research. It's governance research and it crosses all these areas. If you take that approach, I think, I think you can make greater contributions that way than by creating, you know, climate change literatures that nobody outside of climate change looks at. Um, but it also keeps you going slow. Uh, it, 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 keeps you from writing to the newspaper because no one newspaper article is going to really address your topic. It's going to be just an example of your topic in a particular area. So I think that the not, not writing to the newspapers and doing these horizontal governance theorizing things are, are mutually supportive. I would say that a really great area for the future is change in governance. And the kinds of change, the kinds of changes that lead to governance of different kinds, the kinds of changes that take place within government governance, and the kinds of changes that governance can promote. You've done actually some of this. Tom Hale is doing this. There's a lot of interesting stuff about this. Uh, it's very difficult, but I think that's the future. And th this paper that Duncan mentioned that is 20 years old or more is about change. And I'm really excited to be thinking about that. Thank you so much. Uh, we have a few questions from the audience, but we only have a few minutes left. So I think we'll start with two. 
And uh, I'll try to pass the rest of them along to you so you can have a look. Um, so first question we have uh, from Rita, she was asked, who's saying that at the beginning of the webinar, you mentioned that soft law and soft modes of governance are not a failure, but they can be better. So they can be the better solutions. Throughout your work, have you found that there are certain characteristics of particular fields of law or governance that can predict whether soft or hard governance forms will be more successful? Or instead, have you noticed variation over time of what forms of governance are preferred by states? And then we have a second question uh, related to regional governance, uh, who asked, the global part of global governance seems to become more regional given the proliferation of regional actors. Why is this the case? And what are its implications for global governance? So if we can maybe start with those, um, I think that's all the time we'll have today. Well, two small questions. Uh, yeah. So let me, see, let me see if I can take a, a first stab at them. First, uh, uh, on the question on soft law, are there particular characteristics? The answer is yes. Uh, I, I'm hesitant to do it off the top of my head because I, I'm I like sitting down and working through this, but but think of a couple of things. First of all, soft law is a good way to deal with uncertainty of various types. So uncertainty over time, for example, as you're first getting into, into an area and trying to think, how should we regulate it or how should we govern it in various ways? Um, you can't write the, the final set of rules, even if such a set of rules exist. Uh, and so sometimes taking some hesitant steps and the softness both allows you to take the risk going forward, knowing that you're not bound by it, you can pull back from it, but also allows you to sort of coordinate things together and do some learning along the way on that. So some of the stuff we're doing, in, in, indeed, in, including this, this, this mythical old paper that we we're trying to resurrect, um, is all about how over time you can do things in gradual steps and get somewhere. And, and one thing that's going on there is using softness uh, for those sorts of purposes. Another element that makes softness um, probably a useful way to get into things again related to that is where there are big distributional things where we aren't sure who's going to get how much from it. Again, if you know for sure then you can write the deal to take care account of it but if you don't know that uh, taking a few tentative steps under soft rules and and realizing that there are enough joint gains that even if you're not getting your fair share it's not so bad but also allowing you the possibility of correcting if you're getting not getting your fair share down the road and such. So I, I think you, you could go through and come up with other areas like that that, uh, that suggest when and exactly soft law will, will, will matter. On the, the regional question, um, I'm not sure I have an answer. There obviously is a big issue in the world today about having regional rules and global rules uh, mesh together in ways that are mutually productive. And that there's been some tension in that, in that as, as things have gone, obviously in the trade area, but not just in the tr trade area. I, I guess my, my ideal on this is something like a, a federal sort of solution that down the road will find ways to allow enough local autonomy um, at the same time having enough uh, centralized sort of conformity to make things work. The American experience in the most recent years suggests that that's not so easy to, to achieve in many cases. Uh, so, so I don't want to be too, um, uh, rosy eyed on, on all that. Uh, but but I, I see in principle that there are just some problems that are, are better done at more local levels, and those should be regional or even in some cases down to the state or municipality, others that are more clearly global, and we can start uh, dividing issues around that. And even the ones that are truly global, like global warming, for example, that uh, requires some sorts of modifications to, to deal with local things. Sometimes you can achieve those through um, rules that allow um, for local latitude. So a great example um, the one area where Ken and I actually did some, some more intensive work was on, on corruption type stuff and, and anti-corruption law, laws. And I knew nothing, but this one of the real problems on the it was the different legal systems in Europe and America in terms of dealing with corporations and, and such. And that was actually a thorny problem that was solved by sort of some clever lawyering, realizing they basically had used the language of functional equivalence, uh, allowing states to do whatever they want to do as long as they achieve the same goal they don't they can treat their corporations differentially in terms of getting there so i i, I i'm always pretty optimistic on these things i realize there are real pitfalls but but i think the regional and the global can be synchronized to some extent ken uh, yeah no that's good um i would only add on the soft light the uncertainty is certainly right um <laughs> the uncertainty is certainly right uh there's got to be something about problem type that determines uh, what kind of law would really work. We don't see a lot of soft law in arms control, for example. It's all done by binding treaty 
highly precise, highly elaborated, relatively highly institutionalized in some cases with inspections and so on. So there's got to be a, an aspect of problem type that's re, that's important for this choice. Regional organizations, I don't know an awful lot. I, I would say one thing is there's a, a very big literature on multi-level governance, which I don't think has been fully applied to the global, you know, it's used in domestic analysis, especially in EU analysis, but uh, <clears throat> it could be applied to the global, regional, sub-regional, national nexus of institutions as well. <clears throat> Why there are so many regional organizations, some of it I think is to match the nature of the problems. Um, some is because you need common interests and it may be that regions have, states in a region have more common interests on a particular subject than a broader selection of states. Uh, what I think is very interesting, and there's of course a lot of literature about the Chinese-led institutions, is how much of this is objecting to the you know political control of the of the states that are dominant in the global organizations setting up regional organizations to fight against that uh, that's very interesting but there's a great deal being done in that field uh, and then the final point i would make on this is that this is a great um, laboratory for studying institutional complexity and a number of people have started to do that but that's a that's a very fruitful way to go with uh, regional organizations Thank you so much to both of you for, and also to you, Charlie, for this excellent discussion. It's been really interesting and we have a bunch more questions that I wish we could go on for, for longer, but uh, we will have to wrap up now. And before leaving you, I wanna quickly announce that our Globe webinar series does continue next month with a webinar on the 20th of June featuring Angel Saz Carranza and Ryan Federo on their new book, Management and Governance of International Organizations. So please join us for that. And also this Thursday, <coughs> On the 2nd of June, we're launching a thematic webinar series on the future of global trade governance. And our first webinar in this series brings together Ignacio Garcia Barquero of the um, Directorate General of Trade with Professor Kathleen Clausen of the University of Miami to discuss transatlantic perspectives on WTO reform, challenges and opportunities for the 12th Ministerial Conference. And as always, you can register for those at globe-project.eu. Thank you again, Kenneth and Duncan, and thank you so much, Charlie, for this wonderful discussion today. Um, we hope to see you again soon. And also thank you to our audience for joining in. Uh, so from all of us at the Globe Project, thank you very much and goodbye. <laughs>